Hello everybody. So um, it's amazing to see so many people here on time, which is nice. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about designing inclusively and we've got a load of stories, we've got loads of tips, we've got some tools um, and all of it is designed to help you change society for the better. So before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping. First of all, I'm Charlotte. Um, I'm a business design director at IDN and this is my co-host Enrico. Say hi Enrico. Hello, evening everyone, or afternoon or morning, depending on where you're connected from. <laughs> um, so have a drink, get some crisps, get comfortable, and uh, we'll get started. Um, oh, or we would if my laptop was working. It's always good to have a technical hitch right at the beginning. So for some people who might not know very much about idea, and it might be your first Pi People event. Um, so a tiny, tiny introduction to who we are. Um, we're a design and business transformation consultancy. We combine design, business, and technology, and our aim is to create products and services that are good for people and people and good for the planet. Uh, we're a collection of thinkers, storytellers, makers, um, but we're aligned around one purpose, which is to challenge what's possible. Um, most importantly, and this ex this extends to the whole high people community is that we're constantly curious and eager to learn. So Pi People was set up to be a, a group of people with curious minds, people that want to le learn, that want to um, meet other interesting people that might at some point want to consider coming to work for us, although this isn't a recruitment sales pitch, I promise. Um, so obviously, usually uh, with Pi People, we have pretty much this format, but in the real world, we would also have some networking, we would uh, have some amazing food and drink, and we would all get to know each other. With this format, we still get to have the great speakers, and we also still have loads of opportunities for you guys to join in. Um, but we don't get to see you. So actually, we would really love for you to um, send us some photos of where you're watching from. This is the uh, a couple of examples of the last ones. You don't have to have a piano or an ice cream maker as your laptop stand. They're, that's not compulsory. Um, but yeah, it would be great if you could uh, use the uh, social things on the left to uh, tell us where you're watching from. It just gives us, us a bit more of a sense of the fact that there are people out there. Um, so let's uh, crack on. Uh, so this evening, I'm going to do a really quick intro to inclusive design. We've spent quite a lot of time over the last probably nine months building out our inclusive design offer at ID and trying to get to a place where we understand what it is that we need to get better at and also how we can help clients get better at it. So I'll do a super fast intro to that. Then I'm going to hand over to um, Hannah, who's going to talk about um, the new TFL, TFL Go, the new uh, TFL app, which is super exciting and is inclusive by default. We'll then have Charlie, who's one of our product managers at ID and talking about positive prioritization and demoing a new tool that we've developed. Then we will have um, a Cards for Humanity demo. So uh, Cards for Humanity, we launched the uh, online version of it a few weeks ago, and we've been blown away by how much positive feedback we've had about it. Um, it's been amazing. So we thought we'd give you a little bit of a demo, get, give you a chance to play with it, um, so that you can all then take that back into your workplaces and uh, maybe not workplaces, maybe just you want to make your lives more inclusive. Then finally, we've got um, Srin, uh, who's going to talk about uh, accessibility as an opportunity. Um, so that will be super interesting as well. Srin was a co-founder of a um, an accessible travel startup, which he sold to Airbnb. So um, it's a pretty, it's a great story about how accessibility can it's, it's definitely not just an after, afterthought. And then uh, we're going to have a bit of a wrap up. We've also got a competition this evening, which is uh, something we haven't done before, but we thought it would be fun to give it a try. Um, just before we launch into all of the content, um, we've tried to make this evening as accessible as possible. So uh, some of the things are a little bit rough and ready. Uh, you're probably enjoying the fact that um, 
Google's automatic captioning doesn't really recognize the word idean. We've tried practicing saying it in loads of different ways. Um, it just comes up with a, a different version every time. But we do have automatic captioning. We're also um, we're recording this and we're also going to share a transcript of it for anybody that wants a transcript. YouTube has a live replay option if uh, you don't catch something and you want to replay it slightly. And also, uh, we wanted to make this a really safe place. So feel free to um, share your thoughts, uh, be yourselves, uh, obviously uh, stay respectful. But um, yeah, we just we want this to be as inclusive as possible, as accessible as possible. Um, we know that the automatic captioning is a little bit, um, uh, what's the word? Temperamental, maybe. So uh, bear with us. We're doing the best we can. If you're having real problems with it, please let us know and we'll see if there's anything we can do as we're going to try and fix that. So uh, having said all that, uh, I'm going to just give you a super quick introduction to uh, inclusive design and specifically what we're trying to do about it. So for anybody that doesn't know, Inclusive design is the design of mainstream products and or services that are accessible to and usable by as many people as possible. Um, it's been around since the 1970s and grew out of a movement to set web accessibility standards. But actually, one of the things that we're um, really keen to keep at the core of what we're doing is that, A, it goes beyond accessibility. And also, it's not we're not talking about minorities here. It's like this. this uh, this kind of thinking affects a huge amount of people. So just looking at these stats, which are from the World Health Organization, 7 million people of working age in the UK have a disability. 45% of adults over state pension age are disabled. But actually, one of the things that we've talked about quite a lot over the last few months is that um, this only talks about people with permanent disabilities, but actually then there are people who have a temporary disability, maybe they've got um, a broken leg, so they're discovering all of a sudden that actually moving around as, as a less abled person or a differently abled person can be incredibly difficult. Um, or if you're on the tube and you've got headphones on, you're listening to loud music and you can't hear the announcements, that's a kind of a, an even more temporary, so or a situational um, disability that just, it means that you're, you experience the world in a different way and actually, when you start including those types of um, limits to the way you can experience the world, then then we're talking about millions and millions and millions of people, basically everybody. One of the things that I've talked about a lot over the last few months is that having been working from home with a toddler, you suddenly realise that uh, you can't hear a lot of conversations because somebody's shouting in your ear. I can never find the mute button on um, Hangouts to unmute. So I, I, I miss quite a lot of conversations and it very quickly starts to affect how you experience the world because um, you feel like you're not engaging properly in conversations and it's a very alienating experience. So it's super important to think about people with um, with permanent disabilities as, as, a, as a way of thinking about everybody else as well. Uh, designing for people with disabilities or impairments is going to make things better for everybody. Um, but also, uh, it's not just about uh, disabilities. Inclusive design is also about um, fostering a sense of belonging and inclusion. We've seen a lot this year about um, the need for society, our society, America's society, basically everywhere, to get better at um, making people feel like they belong. And as a product and service designers, I think there's something that we can do that is super important around that. Um, so we all talk a lot about um, human-centered design, about um, involving people in research, about taking very much a, a people-first approach to our products and services. And from an inclusive design perspective, that means involving them in the research, in the, in the product development process, in the testing process, so that we really get all of those voices um, but actually, when you then start to think about all of the different ways that people experience the products and services we design and the different things that we need to consider, then actually it's it's mind blowing. It's completely there are limitless combinations. So it, looking at this list on screen, it's not just about one of those things. People have multiple things of those things. So you have somebody who is 
is blind, is bisexual, is 75, the way they in interact with products and services that we're designing is, is, is going to be really different. And actually, we need to, we need to find ways to um, help us be better at that. So that's one of the ooh, that's one of the reasons we invented invented created built cards for humanity. This isn't a replacement for primary research, but actually, cards for humanity is a really great way of extending um, the way we think about the people we're designing for. It's a really great way of building empathy. So we're going to do a demo later. So I'm not going to talk about this very much at the moment, um, but it's it's. It, it's really awesome, actually. It's it's incredibly um, easy to use, really insightful. We're really proud of it. I've, we've been using it quite a lot internally. It makes a big difference. Um, so one more note from me, which is to say that, um, so I said at the beginning, I'm a business designer. Um, inclusive design is, is, is a huge financial opportunity for, for all businesses for by not designing for people who have different needs. We're excluding millions of customers and uh, reducing the amount of revenue that we can get from our customers. So inclusive design isn't purely a financial thing. It's, it's, I think it's a way that we can design a better society, but it is also a really good commercial imperative. We should be doing this. It's really good for business. It's really good for customers and it's really good for society. Um, so I guess, uh, one other thing to say is that we started having this conversation by talking primarily to people who were um, heads of vulnerability, heads of vulnerable customers, uh, heads of diversity and inclusion, like some of the big companies who we work with. And we met loads of really interested people who were really keen. But actually what we learned is that many of them don't have, um, they don't hold budgets. They don't actually have the power to make to make those decisions, to, to really get those changes through. So one of the things that we've started doing is trying to shift the conversation to the people that do have the power to affect change. And that's basically you. Um, so uh, product people, designers, innovators, you basically get to decide what goes in front of the CEO for sign off. Um, so this is, it's basically in your hands. We're doing everything we can to become more inclusive in the work that we do we basically we, we started out trying to sell in inclusive design projects we're not doing that anymore because all our projects need to be inclusive and actually there's no such thing as an inclusive design project uh, what we do is we design inclusively and we're aiming to get better and better at that so i've talked for too long already um i'm gonna hand over to enrico um and he's going to um Hello. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's a this is a fantastic opportunity, and for us it would be fantastic to hear what you all have to say about designing more inclusively. Um, if we reflect for a second, uh, reflect about the moment we are in, there has never been a better time and a better moment to talk about inclusivity, to share our ideas in forum like this one. And also, just very simply, with our peers, with our communities, and in our workplaces. So I think it's great to have you all here. Um, my name is Enrico, and I'm a product designer at IDN. And tonight, I'll be introducing you to three amazing speakers, one of the most amazing speakers that we had so far in Pi People. So <clears throat> before doing that, we have... Um, one more practical note. So we're going to use um, Mentimeter. So you can see on the slide that we are referring to menti.com. Um, it's a tool that um, basically you're gonna be able to share your thoughts anonymously. And if you want to join the conversation, you can join it using your phone or just open a new tab um, on your browser. You go to menti.com and put the code that is there on the slide. So it's 8042479. Once you're all set, we can do like a, a quick warm up. I would say, if you can tell us in one word, how are you feeling about this session tonight? Again, don't worry, it's anonymous. 
So if you want to, you can start sharing. OK. We have curious, excited, included. That's very good. That's a good start. Uh, thankful, informed. Very nice. And thank you for sharing. I can see you're, you're all connected. You're sharing also emojis. That's great. Um, I think for me personally, um, I mean, I'm really excited about tonight. It's partly because it's the biggest crowd we have ever had um, for Pi people. And also because building our inclusive design practice has been a big focus over the past few months. Um, it's great to be able to share our experience with you and also to learn from you. Inclusive design, I think, is a wonderful topic. Um, it's kind of a hot topic at the moment. Um, but it can also get a little bit uncomfortable at times. And for some people, um, it's mainly because we are all influenced by our own, our own biases. Um, but to be fair, I mean, it's also true that if we are all here tonight, if we hold 200 plus people are all here connected tonight, it's because that we are all trying to get better at handling this subject. So um, I think what we also know is that the, um, I think we are a great community. We built is also an idea and a great community of thinkers, makers, adventurers, entrepreneurs. So the only thing we're asking you tonight is to, is to tonight and also beyond tonight, of course, is to stay curious, to ask a lot of questions, to share your thoughts, and as always, be respectful and open. But OK, no further ado. Let's jump in straight with our first speaker. I think we just have uh, like 30 seconds of like uh, technical shifts, and we're going to be back. Hello again. Um, so first speaker, I am delighted to introduce Hannah, Head of Experience at Transport for London. Uh, Hannah leads a team of designers um, responsible for strategy, innovation and design across all digital channels. She recently launched TFL Go, which is totally groundbreaking for TFL and also for transport apps in general and especially for inclusive design. We will be opening up the floor later for a few questions after Anna's talk. Um, so if you have any, any thoughts to share, if you have any question, you can both uh, use the uh, YouTube chat or the Menti if you prefer. So welcome, Anna. Hi, so I'm Hannah. Um, I'm the head of experience at TFL. 
I head up um, a strategic design team within TFL Digital. Um, and we've been building the team for about four years. We're responsible for all digital channels, um, all apps, the website, and also digital displays and station. Um, as you would um, think, the sort of we're, we're, we're doing research. Uh, we're all sort of hybrids. We're um, designing the UI, and we're also um, informing the, pro the product propositions together with our product managers. Um, we're part of this, uh, you know, Transport for London um, brand, which you're all very familiar with if you're uh, in London and traveling a lot. Um, and, it's, and we have, as an organization, a very, very long design history that is all about making the city accessible because the city really um, is the place in which we work, in which we live, in which we have friends, in which we grow up. Um, and it's part of our uh, entire uh, design history. So everything that we have within uh, TFL that has to do with marketing or uh, customer information is all focused on um, making the network a part of public life. As you can see here in this poster, so to travel more is to learn more, which, which is um, very much sort of at the core of, of what we are all about. Um, this goes back all the way to sort of uh, someone called Frank Pick. Um, I encourage you to read up on him. He very early on sort of um, made sure that illustrators and designers and architects uh, in kind of uh, work closely with Transport for London at the time, it was called differently, um, to, to encourage people to travel and to see it as an opportunity to explore the city. So it's very much about um, infrastructure being culture rather than just a means to get from A to B. So here you can see several posters throughout our history, and I just wanted to show them because um, I think you're all familiar with this if you, again, if you live in London, but it's just um, interesting, just a range of, of illustrators and artists um, that we got to work with over, over the years, um, you know, including a um, Man Ray poster here. Um, so transport is really about living in this major city and taking part in public life. Art on the Underground is part of this. Um, and it's just important to note again that this is very unusual. So other cities don't necessarily have this. And it's about, again, taking part in the city's public life, uh, bringing in the neighborhoods, bringing in the history, bringing in people, and um, just being aware of the fact that we spend a great amount of time on the network, on the tube, in buses. Uh, it's kind of where we live and where we spend um, our lives. Um, navigating this very big city is a challenge, um, and so making making it inclusive and accessible has all, also always been part of our design history. Um, as you're all aware, probably uh, the tube map was a very um, groundbreaking tool in that respect. So, in the history of design, um, it's one of the major sort of communication design pieces that exist. Uh, because it took something that's geographic um, and turned it into a very accessible tool uh, in this, you know, that everybody could use. Um, you could put it into your pocket and you would be part of London. I think this is very important also, uh, you know, to understand. So if you look at the very sort of north west there, that's Emerson, that's a very far out. That's really, really sort of in the Chilterns. Um, but you're still a Londoner. You're still part of the city because you're on the tube map. Um, very soon now, um, you know, we'll have the Elizabeth line and, and it will go all the way out and you'll still be part of London. So the tube map, in a way, um, makes you feel part of the city and allows you to go around and, 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 and feel like a Londoner. Um, and it's core to our history. Similarly, the underground uh, roundel really made it possible for people to find underground stations and tube stations and, uh, tube stations on the street. So, you know, that signage system didn't, didn't exist. Um, um, and it was very difficult to find underground stations in the past. And so, you know, part of our history is all about wayfinding and finding 
uh, these stations that you could use to get around the city and go very far and, and, and explore um, what you could do. Similarly, um, our typography and our typeface played a major role in making the transport system accessible. Um, so there are these kind of really foundational pieces of design within our history that, that allowed everyone in London to start using the tube um, uh, on a daily basis. So being inclusive by default in a way is already part of that design history. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's interesting that it never really made it into the digital world. Um, so it's very much part of how all the other design teams and all the other designers and working in TFL and with TFL have been thinking about inclusive, inclusivity, but it was never really, uh, you know, an aspect within the digital um, uh, teams that work with us. So when we kind of set out to build this team um, and to think about revamping and rethinking our products, uh, we felt that inclusivity really had to be uh, at the core and center of what we do, um, and that it should have the same place um, that it has, you know, in all our wayfinding and all our other communication uh, tools. Um, so, similar to what Charlotte just said, um, I think it's quite interesting, sort of, when we're talking about inclusivity, there's a whole range of things. And so, what we decided was to take a very broad approach in the first instance. Um, so, there is this very simple fact that sometimes things are hard to see, that some th sometimes being out there on the tube or on a bus is just distracting, it's too loud, it's too fast, it's too much. If you're opening up your phone on top of it, it's just confusing, uh, making sense of what you're seeing on the screen in conjunction with what you're seeing on the street um, or uh, at a platform can be highly disorienting. Um, it's sometimes just makes no sense, it's un unintelligible. Uh, and of course, lots of people have anxiety and, you know, and, and so there is just this general um, sense of having to have products in general and uh, especially digital products that just make all of that um, much easier. And so the, what we did um, very early on was to look at all the accessibility guidelines that are out there for different types of um, accessibility needs. And what we found was there were some really basic common denominators um, that had to do with very well-structured content, very clear, plain language, lots of space around elements, knowing exactly what to do next, not being overwhelmed, the interface not to be too fast, uh, you know, too, you know, moving, moving too fast and, 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 and displaying too many items. So in a way, just really good design would help. And we decided to just take that approach at a base level. So we, we built a new, we, we kind of decided to just um, create a, an entirely new design language that would strip back all the noise and would focus very clearly on typography and information hierarchy um, and lots of space and very and, and adding information very subtly um, and that then helped us very much with assistive technologies as well so that was the first step however there are other things obviously the network is still um, not very accessible when it comes to people who for example have severe mobility impairments if you're a wheelchair user um, it's still quite difficult to get the information that you need um, so, for instance, if you are, um, if you need to board a train, you might need a manual ramp to be operated by staff. You might need to know that there's a designated access point, whatever that is. Um, and it's a point where you need to um, enter the train in order to also alight the train. So it's quite important to find it, but it's hard to understand what it does and what it is, um, and where, the, whether it is there or not in the station where you need it. Um, there are. Um, you know, life lift issues often that, that you know, can create a really um, horrendous situation for people um, that are bound to wheelchairs where, you know, we, we had horrendous stories coming out of user research um, of people getting stuck on the network for hours, um, not being able to go anywhere, not, 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 not being able to really get the help they wanted, although we are trying really hard to help people in that situation, but it's, it's just really difficult. 
And what it does is it creates these um, barriers that have to do with perception. So the risk to go out onto the network is much, much higher. And the, the risk to have a delay, the risk to get stuck, to the risk to just be exposed to a really difficult situation is much higher. Um, and, and it causes people to just lose confidence in what they are able to do. And we had feedback from user researchers recently, which again sort of um, highlighted this, this problem where people said to us that they hadn't used the tube ever in their lives or that they had used it once or twice uh, and then decided no longer to use it because um, they had this one uh, situation that they experienced that was so horrible that they would never ever try it again. Uh, we had stories where people couldn't use the tube and then had to um, uh, had to book a taxi and it cost you know hundreds of pounds. Uh, we had stories where um, um, where people couldn't use the toilet. I mean, just really difficult situations. So uh, it's worth mentioning. I think that's is really important. The bus network is very accessible for people with wheelchair users fairly accessible for people with wheelchair users, but the tube isn't. And the tube is still the fastest mode that we have within London. So additionally to this kind of foundational um, new design language that allowed us to um, create products that are as accessible as possible to, to, to the widest sort of, um, uh, to, to wide groups uh, with accessibility needs, um, we also decided to take the challenge to the next level and really think about how we can create a product that would be very useful for people with these quite severe uh, mobility impairments. Um, that required, in a way, um, a, a new approach to, to how we do design and how we do data and how we do innovation. So uh, obviously there are lots of innovation trials happening all the time especially around accessibility. There are quite a lot of interesting technologies that are being trialed all the time by very good teams who care a lot about accessibility, uh, but they tend to not make it into the mainstream products that we have, um, which is also quite common, I would say. Uh, data often, the, date, the process of generating data, commissioning data, maintaining data often is slightly disconnected from the product management and experience design um, process. And um, yeah, and the design teams, yeah, like I said, they are often not involved in innovation necessarily, and they're not often involved in the design of data. So one of the things that I think is really new in the way that we approach this now is that we've changed this. We have taken on the task of actually being innovative in that we think constantly about new technologies and new ways of doing things and trialing them within the team in a way so that we can scale these ideas up very quickly rather than um, having to wait for anyone else to do it. So we've embedded innovation as something um, that we do as often as we can within the team. We have designers involved in um, the creation and, and, and shaping of data, especially in, uh, in the context of accessibility, uh, but also more generally speaking. And um, yeah, and we have this kind of global new design language which, which, which sets the foundations um, for, for all our digital products. I think that is the bit that really uh, is completely new and groundbreaking. So, as I just said, I think I just wanted to kind of um, elaborate a little bit on that. When we talk about data, so there's a lot of talk about data, and obviously, you know, as TFL, we always had a very strong open data policy, and we still do. We, we absolutely want to make all our data public, and we do, uh, and that will stay. Um, but um, this is what data is. This is Margaret Hamilton. She, she wrote all of this. Uh, it's obviously not only data, it's also algorithms in here. It's um, it's, that's what it is. It's books, books, uh, it's text, there's endless amounts of text that uh, enables computers to do things. Uh, she wrote all of this as part of the Apollo project in 1969. Uh, and I think it just kind of illustrates, illustrates very nicely um, sort of what we're talking about when we're talking about data. And some of you may know this and some of you may not, but this is what it is. It's not accessible uh, in itself. It's genius, but it's not 
doing the job of um, enabling people to do the things that they need to do with it. So just publishing data is not enough if you want to make sure that the tools and the products you're creating are uh, accessible and inclusive and of high quality. So we had to really invest into UI. Now, not many people get to do this, but we set out to actually look at the UI in a completely new way um, and to rethink it rather than just having a mapping platform that already exists and doing what other apps are doing, um, having elements on those maps and, you know, and having some roots on those maps. We thought, let's take a step back. Let's look at this again. Let's think about the UI very thoroughly and let's make the UI accessible and usable in a way that that nobody has done because we believed that there was a way to do this better and to provide a way to um, uh, to the network that would allow people to just understand what was going on. Um, similarly, we also did uh, uh, we also were very very keen on making sure that digital touch points in general, any digital touch points, would be looked at in the context, which is. Similar to, you know, I think the example that I always like to take here is the, the road uh, signage, uh, road sign project um, by Margaret Calvert and um, Kinner, um, where it was very much about making road signs, again, accessible to everyone on the road. And it was quite a difficult task because if you're in a car and you're speeding and you're uh, driving fast and, 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 and drive by a road sign, it doesn't mean that you can see what's on it. Um, so they worked very hard on this transport typeface uh, in order for it to be legible within about four seconds at an angle of 515 degrees and an average speed of 70 uh, miles per hour. And that's the situation we're in, for example, when we're talking about digital displays and stations. So if you're thinking about the station environment and you're walking through it, um, you know, you're, you're, you're spending maybe about two seconds, if at all, to look at a poster or a digital uh, sign. Um, so, and it might be crowded. Um, so it's very important to get the information on these screens right and to make them work for people. Um, so, yeah, so similarly, we needed a product that people could have in their pockets. Obviously, we until now only had uh, a website, so we we worked very hard on the proposition of a mainstream travel app that could work within the already quite busy environment that we're in with, with lots of apps that are doing a great job uh, uh, in many ways. And so we, yeah, we, we developed a proposition uh, for T the proposition for TFL Go, which was to really assist people on the go um, and to be extremely inclusive, inclusive by default in a way that nobody else kind of can offer. Um, uh, and we redesigned the, the, the status update sports in stations. They are being rolled out as we speak. So if you go to a tube station now, you should be able to see them. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that later, what we did with these, but um, uh, yeah. So just to come back to this idea of having these products in place. Um, one of the key aspects of all the work that we did as well, and it plays out really uh, well now in the context of accessibility, is that uh, obviously these products and, uh, um, and services and touch points work together. So if you are at home, uh, you're not really traveling yet, you have lots of choices. Uh, you can spend the time to, to, to decide whether you do this or that. And that is a context that we need to take very seriously. Um, so we have certain features and certain products that are designed to just deliver that planning and having choices experience. Um, whereas when you're getting to a station, um, your options narrow. You don't really have um, you know, uh, a choice to maybe change your journey. You you don't you know you can't just go somewhere else now or take another take another mode so you 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 just you just have to take this tube uh, right there that you that you set out to to use and so what can we do in that context in that moment can we give you a choice can we can we advise you can we give you something uh, that you could do next so handing over um, 
and providing actionable advice. Uh, it, you know, if, if, if you're already through the gate line, there's very little you can do. But can we still help you there uh, with installation wayfinding, for example? That's a topic that we're thinking a, a lot about. And, and what role would digital displays play in this context? And how could the app, for example, be hyperlocal and give you hyperlocal information? We're just at the beginning of, of this, but um, we're already seeing sort of um, ideas emerging now. And we're having, um, you know, quite a lot of promising ideas i think in making this uh, uh, quite a, a well-designed ecosystem in the future um obviously also the phones um are something that we discourage people to use in certain parts of a station um you know in the corridors when people are walking through it and so on so it's not always the best way to access information stations in general are very complex and for again people with accessibility needs this is highly confusing uh, and it involves all sorts of things. Um, you know, first of all, of course, the lifts and whether they are working and if they're not working, what you could do. Um, equally so, sort of, you know, that some parts of the stations might be extremely busy, finding the right exit, finding the right entrance. There are endless amounts of issues. So um, one of the things that we're definitely looking into is making that a lot easier uh, with the app and the digital displays in the future. Anna, can I just jump in to say, yeah. Uh, you've probably got about five minutes left, but it would be great. We've got some questions come in. So maybe I, I think everybody will really like the demo you want to show. So maybe okay. fast track towards that bit. Sorry. No problem. Um, so, yeah, so, so just very quick before I start the demo, um, the, the screens, um, um, I don't know if you know the old screens, but the old screens had a, a lot of information on them. Ba very shortly, what we've done with the screens is we've, uh, you know, the type is much larger. The information hierarchy now is localized so that you get only the, inf so it's first of all, only the, um, only the disruptions that you get. So we've kind of taken a lot of information off the screens and you can look at them from afar and get the information that you need at a glance, which is a huge uh, accessibility improvement. And we're also including life lift status on them. So that's kind of the, the, the biggest change. Um, in terms of the, the app, what I wanted to show you, we took a design by John McGill, which is um, uh, an accessible uh, tube map that, that reducts all the stations, so takes out all the stations that are not accessible. And that's exactly what we've done in the app. And I'll demo the app as we speak. Um, so let me just get out of here. Yes. So. Yeah, so let me demo the app and talk you through this real quick. So, um, so the, the most important thing we've done, um, which is completely new, is that this map is now not a PDF, but this map is data-driven. It's a dynamic map. And you can uh, zoom in, you can zoom out, you can uh, show elements as you interact with the map. Um, the benefit of that is that we can swap the map, as you will see, into another state. So we can have a step-free map. This again. So here on this map, we show the step-free network. And we take out all the stations that are currently not accessible, as you can see. So it's very clear which parts of the network are accessible or not. We're also exposing information that's currently only available in printed maps. Um, those are the interchange, interchange only accessible stations. So for example, Oxford Street is a station that you can, where you can interchange between the Victoria line and the Bakerloo line in one direction, but that's hidden on the normal tube map that you would see. Here you know, oh yes, I can actually interchange between these two lines. Um, but you can't access it from the street. So that's very important information. We're also showing the stations that are only accessible in one direction, which is highly confusing often, and it's difficult to get that information. So here, Borrow, for example, is only step-free um, northbound. And most importantly, um, we have included quite a lot of detailed step-free information, which again is 
is only available in printed maps at the moment. So we've digitalized a lot of that data. Um, and you can now see whether there is a level access point or a manual ramp, what the gaps and steps are, um, and so forth. And you can report an issue. So it provides very detailed information, in, in, again, in a mainstream app that everybody can use. Um, and it's just simply there. Um, there are many other things in this app. You can also plan a journey. Obviously, you can see a status board. So definitely download it and, and have a look. Um, but given that I only have five minutes, I just wanted to also highlight that we crafted the voiceover experience, which is something that often gets lost. Um, so I'll probably just talk you through that real quick rather than demoing it. But what we did was we suppressed the map in the voiceover experience so that you don't get confused and you have I mean, we identified the core features that are in the app for, that, that are usable by people who use voiceover they are planning a journey uh, getting the status uh, update of the network but most importantly also getting the arrival times per platform and that's very easy to access via voiceover and uh, so you could stand uh, on a platform and get um, the arrival times of the next trains via voiceover and there's really no other way to get that at the moment. Thank you. Cool, cool. Thank you, thank you. That was really insightful. Very interesting. The work that you're doing for uh, for TFL. Um, I think, in the interest of time, we have maybe space for one question, and I'm just going to read it right now. So, Hannah, um, has the pandemic affected the way you design for TFL users? And if so, how? It's um, accelerated the product launch because the app allows us now to um, provide information to people quicker. And um, so, so, so we might have not launched the app as early otherwise. Oh, that's really good. I think it's a probably similar scenario for for other for other companies as well. Yeah, but that's that's really good. Um, again, so next up we have um, we have Charlie. So if you can be patient and just give us a, a minute to do another switch, and we will be back in a minute. Hello again. Um, so now we have uh, our own Charlie. Um, Charlie joined IDN uh, at the beginning of the of the lockdown, and um, as part of our product team. And she has been right in the middle of all our um, inclusive uh, design toolkit building, as well as doing some amazing work for clients. So 
good work very very well very well done as a product manager prioritization is close to charlie's heart and she's going to talk about how thinking a little differently about prioritization can have a big impact on keeping inclusive design front of mind throughout the product development cycle again if you have any question you can put them in the youtube chat or in the Manti, and we will be able, like, depending on the time, but we will be able to as, ask as many as we can later on. So over to you, Charlie. Thanks, Enrique. Um, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Charlie. Um, I'm super excited to be a part of this event. Um, and as Enrique said, I've been working on um, building out our inclusive design toolkit at IDEAN um, and it's really great to have the opportunity to talk to um, such an awesome crowd about inclusive design. Um, so I'll be talking about inclusive prioritization and also be demoing the Universal School which is a new tool we've been working on to help with inclusive prioritization um, and then I'll just finish up by talking about some ways in which we can start to measure success. So um, I'm sure lots of people here have um, had experience rushing to get a product to market um, and have heard this being said or kind of said it to um, each other uh, during that kind of really like high intensity prioritization process. Uh, we can fix this data. Let's just launch it now. Um, and it's only after we launch uh, that we kind of go back through our backlog and start to often realize that designing bespoke solutions for certain users um, or building in some of that accessibility functionality that might have been deprioritized is often a lot more time consuming or costly than you think. And it really shouldn't, um, it shouldn't have to be like that at all. So inclusive design should, um, shouldn't be a nice to have or an add on. It should be something that we think about right from the start and all throughout the product process. Um, and yet kind of despite this inclusive design, um, you know, despite it being very much on our radar and like particularly within the design world, we talk about it a lot. Uh, we still continue to see products and services that exclude people from the experience. Uh, and that's either because of their abilities or situational context. Um, and it definitely isn't a new problem. So um, I think this is a case study that kind of like demonstrates this point really literally, um, which is the journey of the emoji. So in 1999, emojis were first born into this world, like that quite rudimentary version with a smiley face um, and, you know, a couple of others like that old school heart emoji that people might remember from the 90s. Um, and after a while, they were standardized by Unicode. So that meant that different brands could start to use them. Um, and it wasn't until 2011 um, when Apple first launched their emoji keyboard that they really sort of went mainstream. Um, and as they did that in that first iteration, they were really criticized at the time for the lack of diversity in that first iteration of the emoji library. Um, and it was fair enough. There was um, like a real lack of diversity in that kind of first um, iteration that they went live with. So one year later, they introduced um, same sex couple emojis, uh, but it took them four years to introduce uh, skin color options for uh, black, Asian and ethnic minorities and also female representation um, in professions like medicine or engineering. So previously you could only be a male doctor um, or on the flip side, you could only be a female hairdresser, but you couldn't be um, a female doctor or a male hairdresser. So there's some real kind of gender stereotyping going on there. Um, and then two years after that, uh, in 2017, they made it a bit easier for some users to express themselves with a greater diversity. Um, so I guess what I mean by that is being able to kind of, um, whereas previously um, as a black woman, you couldn't show kind of any other emotion in the emoji suite apart from just that standard emoji. And so they started to introduce things like being able to show that you were frowning or, you know, uh, raising your hand. Um, but it, it really only scratched the surface um, of kind of uh, creating like what is a truly diverse representative set of emojis. Um, so for people who um, are disabled, I guess the question is, how long do you think that they had to wait? And the answer is um, a really long time. So uh, emojis for people who are disabled weren't introduced until 2019. So that's just last year. Um, it was eight years after um, inception and four years after Apple's diversity push in 2015. And just to give that some more context around like what was being prioritized at this time, um, it was two years after Google CEO said he would drop everything to prioritize where to position the cheese and the burger emoji. I don't know if anyone heard about that, but apparently it was a big debate going on. 
Um, and it was also one year after Apple promised to address the incredibly urgent issue of a lack of cream cheese in the bagel emoji, which was known as uh, hashtag bagelgate, I've come to realize. Um, which kind of sounds laughable, but it's um, for people who are in the minority and, and live in a world where they often um, face challenges or aren't um, kind of included in experiences, it can be really, really isolating to kind of not feel connected to these products and services. Um, and they weren't the only ones, so there's so many examples examples of this so um cultural themed emojis remained really westernized until 2018 and what i mean by that is kind of different cuisines different flags um, and a gender neutral emoji wasn't available in 29 until 2019 so last year and there's just so many more examples that i could go into um and the thing is that emojis i guess are a good example because they represent lots of human choices and constant decision making and prioritization um, and that's often having uh happening in kind of uh what seems to be quite a limited cultural context um, and in this example uh the needs of those who were not represented in the decision making process were obviously being deprioritized which is kind of why we can see such a long uh time for it to take to kind of um, build out a more diverse group of um, emojis so let's take another example um, and look at the government's response to COVID. Um, so uh, over the last sort of six, seven months, um, kind of governments all over the world have been providing um, financial aid to lots of people who are struggling either because they've lost their job um, or they um, are yeah, struggling to pay rent. And that obviously is a really great initiative and it's really important. But to access the support um, in lots of places, you need to complete a, an online form. Um, and so for many people who are lacking in digital literacy or struggling with um, maybe zero access to the Internet or limited access or with the kind of unmet, um, otherwise unmet accessibility needs, um, they haven't been able to access that financial aid and they also haven't really been able to do things like basic banking needs you know like just checking your balance or trying to pay a bill that they might have been going into the branch to do and it's often people that are really vulnerable that are the ones who are kind of really struggling to access these types of things so where are we going wrong is the question um the reality is that i suppose a lot of it comes down to different priorities um, and this is, yeah, even this is a quote from, from a while back, I think it sums it up quite nicely. Um, so Gandhi said, it's not just words, actions expresses priorities. Um, and when it comes to inclusive design, we talk a lot about our intentions to design more inclusively, but when it comes to actually embedding, um, embedding inclusive design into our processes, we definitely uh, lack the right tools or teams lack the right tools and frameworks to actually take action to design more inclusively. And a big part of that is that organizations have been using the same sorts of frameworks to, I guess, uh, state their priorities and decide which idea to choose over another. And it usually kind of um, goes something like this. So we, we sort of end up asking questions like, um, does this idea solve the needs um, of our target audience? Uh, does this idea support our business strategy or is it you know, differentiated from other products in the market? So if you're sort of a tech savvy, millennial or Gen Z, which is so often the target audience that um, kind of we we get for our clients. Um, it's great. But for everyone else, your needs are definitely uh, going to be deprioritized in that process. And that's just not great. Um, and while they're all sensible questions to be asking, uh, we're missing a crucial question, which is, will this idea allow everyone to access, use and enjoy the experience regardless of their ability, situation or context? So by sort of not asking this question or not thinking about this kind of explicitly um we're we're sort of intentionally or not deprioritizing certain needs over others um and as a result we're excluding some people from the experience and often those who are the kind of the most vulnerable and need us the most um so as a result i think it's often kind of ends up being the case that teams build in accessibility functionality um kind of like just pre-launch or, or sometimes i guess retrofit certain features once the product is live to kind of negate the fact that perhaps that original idea wasn't really inclusive of lots of people. Um, but then often what happens is, I guess lots of these I, these kind of um, lots of these things are deprioritized just because of competing um, priorities set by often set by the business. So things like budget or time constraints. Um, and in the case of Apple's emojis, I think where people have been constantly giving them feedback that, um, you know, that they needed to kind of expand on what they already had. Um, it just felt like a little bit too late for lots of people. So if we want to include uh, increase the chances of uh, inclusive ideas, making it through the product funnel, 
uh, we need to sort of re-examine what our priorities are and take action to express those priorities. Uh, so this is something that we've been thinking a lot about at IDEAN um, recently, and uh, we've developed a uh, framework that we're calling the Universal Score. So I'm just going to jump out now and just uh, demo this to you. Cool. Um, so the Universal Score is a tool to encourage inclusive prioritization. Um, so this started out as, uh, I suppose, a matrix in Notion, which is our internal wiki um, that we created to kind of like start to think about more inclusive questions that we can ask ourselves when prioritizing ideas. Um, and uh, we've tested it with some project teams and we got some really useful feedback. And um, thanks to uh, the like awesome designer, Eva, and awesome developer Sid, who've been helping build this out into a prototype, we've created a kind of a first iteration of an interactive prototype. Um, so I'm just going to go through and demo how it works. So the idea is that you can run your idea through our inclusivity filter and find out just how inclusive they are. So there's four questions that we're asking. Um, the first is around whether or not the idea promotes mental well-being. And so we've got some provocations that we've included here um, to sort of help teams think about this in different ways. So does the idea kind of remove ambiguity to reduce the level of worry over what will happen next? Does it steer away from creating an unnecessary sense of urgency? Um, so things like countdown, uh, time is limits, things like that can be super stressful. Um, and does it allow for mistakes? So a lot of that is just good design, um, but it's particularly important for people with anxiety and for kind of encouraging um, mental well-being. And we've included here just a link out to some more resources so that if kind of you don't feel like you know enough about this to score it, there's some like places you can go to inform yourself um, on this section. And for the purpose of this, I'm just going to score each of these as a one, uh, which I'll, you'll see in a minute why. Um, so the next question is around inviting belonging. Um, so thinking about questions like, does it incorporate visual elements that strive to be more inclusive and less stereotypical? So thinking about like gender neutral colors and things like that. Um, does it rely on cultural norms that might not be shared by all of your users? So like language and humor and, and those things are quite interlinked. Um, so sometimes humor doesn't translate into different languages. Um, and does it present information or ask for interactions um, based on, on sort of outdated models? So things like asking people to identify as a specific gender and, and kind of making sure that the options we have aren't alienating to people. So again, we'll give that a one. Um, and does it support physical needs? So um, does it allow for the use of assistive technologies um, and work in different places? So, um, you know, if you're inside versus outside or if someone's holding a baby and doesn't have the use of their arms, trying to think about um, uh, different types of um, needs to support kind of uh, to support them and just moving on to the last question so does it um, accommodate neurodiversity so what I guess we were thinking of here is um, people with shorter attention spans who um, you know might need kind of minimal screen time um, or to get through a process quicker um, and like different levels of friction to help people with impulsive behaviors um, so let's just score the last one and here it will give you what your universal score is. So um, it's four out of 20, I scored it super low just for the purpose of this demo. Um, and here there's just some um, suggestions for what you can do to raise your game. So um, things like, could you um, set up a co-design with a more diverse group of people to kind of take part in the process? Um, maybe revisit your design principles to think about designing for anxiety. Um, try to like familiarize yourself maybe with uh, the latest assistive technology so it shouldn't just be up to sort of developers and build to kind of actually um, like test out um, things like screen readers um, or voiceovers. We should be like bringing people in at the beginning of the process and all throughout. Um, and then does it kind of um, things around accommodating neurodiversity. So could we design for people with different cognitive needs first and, and most likely we'll end up designing for everyone. So um, this is very much in its early stages, um, but we just thought this was such an awesome opportunity to get feedback from lots of people. So we'll share this after the event. Um, like I said, it's an interactive prototype. Um, it's, you know, very early on, but we'd love to get your feedback on everything from the language we've used um, to the questions we've asked um, and just generally like whether or not it works when you're using it in your own um, with your own ideas and your own products. Um, so we'll share this afterwards, um, along with the email that we send out. Um, so I'll just jump back quickly and just to wrap up. I'm conscious of time, so I will try and hurry along a little bit. OK, 
cool. Um, so we think, I guess, with, with the universal score, the idea is that, um, or what we kind of really believe is that by asking those questions earlier on in the process and all throughout the process, we can start to have a conversation around how inclusive one idea is compared to another. Um, and we might end up disregarding an idea or actually just making some changes to the next iteration. But either way, we are hopefully increasing the likelihood of an inclusive idea coming to fruition. Um, and I think it's also important uh, to call out here that some of those questions that we're asking um, would also be really important to feed into a recruitment brief and in, and in a recruitment screener. So that when we come to actually test those ideas, again, we're like considering as diverse group of people as possible in the research process. Um, and just to note, I guess I'm trying to kind of encourage stakeholders or kind of like getting buy-in on some of these tools. Um, I suppose it's like the ethical benefits that we've talked about aren't necessarily uh, enough, um, even though you'd hope that they would be. Um, thinking about, uh, you know, how much time and effort it takes um, not having built in this type of um, functionality or features and having to do it at the last minute. Uh, and not to mention all the kind of additional customers you'll get from designing to everyone. Um, I think is a really good thing to kind of talk to and bring up when we're trying to kind of um, increase the use of these tools and frameworks within organizations. And just to quantify that number, I think it was the extra cost commission that reported um, businesses who didn't meet the needs of people who are disabled alone could be turning away a share of 420 million in businesses each week in the UK alone. So that's like a staggering number again, just, just to give some more, um, some more fuel there to, to chat to this within your businesses. Um, so just lastly, um, in terms of like the key to success, um, thinking about inclusivity really early on is obviously super important and, and all throughout the process. Um, but just lastly, we also need to kind of think about the success measures themselves. Um, so what we usually track are things like um, retention, engagement, acquisition, those kind of standard product metrics. Um, and the thing is, if we're if we're only tracking this, it's really hard to expect teams to prioritize um, inclusive design if what we're kind of defining as success is, is acquisition as opposed to how inclusive in experience is for our customers. So something we've also been thinking about is um, if we could kind of add to those metrics, things like um, how uh, measuring things like whether our users felt an increase in their sense of belonging or how connected they feel to a product that we've designed or whether there was like a, you know, improved sense of well, uh, feeling of well-being or reduced levels of stress. Um, and then maybe kind of customer feedback surveys would be more more like um, would ask more questions around, you know, is there anything that's stopping you from experiencing this product in its entirety? Um, does it make you feel like you belong to a community and how connected do you feel? Which are all really important questions to be asking customers to start to measure some of the impact of this work and benchmark ourselves. So just to finish up, um, inclusive design should be the default from, from day one. Um, but as I've said, it's not enough just to think inclusively. We need to try and give tools and frameworks to teams so that they can embed this in every part of the process. Um, and if we sort of start to redefine what success looks like, we can hopefully increase the um, likelihood of some more inclusive ideas getting through the funnel. Um, or just going back to the emojis, uh, in Apple's instance or the emoji instance, increase the likelihood um, of a trans pride flag being there from day one. Cool. Thank you, Charlie. That was great. Um, I think we have a couple of minutes for a, like a few questions. I have one immediately right here for you. Uh, it's regarding the prototype. Um, is the plan that this prototype is going to go public, like beyond sharing it with our audience tonight? But is it going to go public? Yeah, I think the idea is so um, beyond sharing it tonight um, and kind of keeping it live for the next few weeks. Eventually we'll build this out, um, um, hopefully uh, build this out, I guess, depending on the feedback that we get from everyone um, and make this something that kind of we could um, make publicly available um, and start to maybe set up some um, sessions to kind of test this at a, a bigger scale. But in an ideal world, we would love to um, make this kind of publicly available. Um, and so it will definitely depend on the feedback that we get and kind of how we can evolve it to make sure that it's kind of um, a useful tool and something that teams can really use at scale. Cool, thank you. I have one more question from our audience. Um, we, we are, I think we all love the presentation about the emojis. We know that basically we are all communicating with emojis nowadays. Um, how can we be more inclusive? for the visually impaired? Do you mean um, specifically, like, as in in the context? 
Yeah, specifically to emojis, yeah, to using emojis. Oh, I see what you mean, yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really, yeah, I think that's a um, like a really good question that um, I suppose I don't have an, an answer for um, in terms of how we can use emojis to be um, like for people who are visually impaired. But I think my first kind of suggestion for that would be to go out and do some research with people um, who are visually impaired and do some testing around, um, like, I guess, different solutions that could work for them and also kind of how um they are read within the context of um screen readers and how that actually comes up in using voiceovers um so like your answer is i i don't have an answer but i would um like love to kind of do some more research into that and actually speak to some people about how we could um like think about things like sound emojis and how you could kind of create the same thing but with a sound as opposed to a visual which would be something we could definitely test with people yeah they could also be voice activated for example, well, yeah, yeah, there are multiple, uh, multiple option. Um, so as usual, um, if we go to the next slide, we're gonna have um, a quick break. So you're gonna give us uh, a minute. We're gonna set up um, our Cards for Humanity demo and we will be back in a minute. We are back again. Um, so we are not gonna. There's been a there's a bit of a change of plan, um, like a last minute change. We're not gonna go through the cards for humanity demo yet. We're gonna do it as a last thing. Um, but now we're gonna introduce our third speaker of the night, uh, Srin Madipali. Uh, Srin is a product manager at Airbnb with a focus on making travel easier for disabled people. In 2015, Sring co-founded Accomobo, a travel platform for uh, uh, people with um, disabilities, which was acquired by Airbnb in um, November 2017. Uh, Sring is going to talk about uh, accessibility as, um, as an opportunity to create a great um, customer experience. Accessibility has historically been treated as a compliance item. But in this talk, Srin shares his experience and learnings from his time at Comable and Airbnb, and how his team has worked towards creating a more accessible and inclusive travel experience. Again, if you have any questions, just keep them, uh, start to type them on the YouTube chat or on the Menti, and we're gonna go through them later. Over to you, Srin. Super, uh, thank you very much. And um, 
Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm really excited to be here today to, to share a little bit more about what we did at Accommable and then at Airbnb. Um, I'm really hoping that, you know, based on sort of a very abridged version of about sort of six to seven years of experience in the space of the next 15 minutes, um, hopefully can demonstrate a, a case study of how focusing on accessibility can be a really great business opportunity and an opportunity to create a great experience, but also um, the fact that, you know, it can be done and there are hopefully some learnings for you all today that you could take to your respective organizations for, for baking accessibility in. So um, as Enrico mentioned, I am, I am the product manager for accessibility within the homes part of, of Airbnb. Um, a couple of gigantic caveats before I start. Um, firstly, um, I am actually leaving Airbnb in the next few weeks. So um, I'm sort of beginning to step down from my role. So a lot of the things that I'm sharing have been sort of work that we've done in the last year or so. Um, and secondly, like accessibility is a huge area. And because we are quite short on time today, I am focusing on one area of our work, which was around uh, building like an accessible travel experience and actually really nicely builds upon some of the, the work that, that Hannah has been doing at TFL relating to how do you take the real world, which can often be very unaccessible to make sure that in a digital world, people understand what exactly they are going to. But first, I'm going to give you a bit of a backstory uh, to myself and, and, and how we started at Commable. Um, so firstly, um, like my name is Shrin, as, as mentioned. And, and I share this photo for, for two reasons. Um, firstly, to prove that I once had, uh, that I once had long hair and good looks. Um, the second reason is that about a, a week after this photo was taken, I was diagnosed with a disability called spinal muscular atrophy. So um, it's a disability I've had all my life, which means that I've, I've never been able to walk. Um, I've always used a power wheelchair to get around and I've had a team of support workers and carers who help me around the clock uh, with all of my all of my day-to-day uh, -day, day -day needs. However, um, Despite that, like I've always really loved to travel. Um, so in 2011, I, I took some time off work. So during that period of my life, I was a corporate lawyer in the city. I was just spending hour after hour, day after day on, on m and deals and not exactly, you know, the most fulfilled. And before that period, I had never traveled before. And I'd always heard of all the amazing stories of my friends who had, you know, gone to all sorts of trips all around the world and I had been just too nervous to travel or I had only gone and traveled to places sort of where sort of parents are forcing you to travel to and had never done anything that I wanted to do. Um, so I took six months off and I went on a trip all around the world that took me around Europe, around America, um, did a camping safari in Southern Africa and also as you can see in this photo um, I, I I went to, uh, on a, an adapted diving center out in Bali and, and learned to scuba dive. And while um, it was the most amazing experience ever, it was just, it was really tough. And lots of times I would turn up to places and things didn't go always to plan. So this isn't a photo from that trip, but actually it's a photo that sums up what the travel experience is often like for disabled people. In, 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 the modern, in the modern age. So this was a photo from 2014. I had just landed in San Francisco after like a 10 hour flight. It's 11 o'clock at night and I turn up to this hotel room. This hotel room says that it is the accessible hotel room. It's designated by the hotel for being like the sort of the accessible room. But as you can see, as a wheelchair user, it is just technically not possible to use it. And I, that evening had to sort of go all around the Bay Area trying to find somewhere to stay at, at you know, 11 o'clock at night. And the sort of, it was all those experiences that planted the seed that, hold on, you know, travel tech can do so many different things. Why is it still an absolute nightmare to find somewhere, to find accommodation that is easy to stay if you have a disability? So um, I quit my job and I actually went back to school again. Uh, and started to retrain as a web developer. And um, 
we teamed up with a friend of mine and we built a very basic prototype of a web app called Accommable in the summer of 2015. Um, there were a couple of things that were unique about this app and it was a bit of a hack together job. But effectively, there was a huge amount of granularity in the filters. So you can see there everything from roll-in showers to lifts to you know, equipment hire, all of these things you could search for on the site. And secondly, we used to joke that we had more pictures of toilets than any other website on the internet. And the reason we, we had this really importantly is that like bathrooms, are, when you're looking for accessible accommodation, bathrooms are often probably the biggest source of variability and it's so central to people's dignity. And so we were so meticulous around photography and making sure that if someone said they had something in, in, in a particular property, there had to be a photo to back it up. So you can see the photo of a listing we had in Barcelona. There's space under the sink. The grab rails are metal. There's space. You can just turn up there and you, you just know this is going to work. And you can get your credit card out and, and quickly make a booking. And so 2015 started the site, um, just shared it out with friends and it took off from there. And like, I feel a bit guilty that I'm abridging a huge amount that happened with the help of a team of extraordinary people. But fast forward two years later, um, we were actually raising money and, and looking for partnerships and were introduced to Airbnb and Airbnb were looking for experts and talent and people who knew about accessibility and, and building product around this area. And um, Airbnb acquired us in, in November 2017. And um, the entire company of Accommable, so we were to build out this new group within Airbnb. And I moved out to San Francisco um, to, to, to lead this new team. And so what started was, was the new beginning, what we called the in-home accessibility team. Um, and so we were really starting from scratch. And just to pose like a challenge and, and, and a question we asked ourselves at the beginning, like how do, you, how do you communicate accessibility on a web platform where you have, what, six and a half, seven million listings spread across 190 countries where every country has a different definition of accessibility and where actually most of these properties are people's private homes that were never built for accessibility in mind. So like, what is a step-free entrance? Is it an entrance with half an inch step, a full inch, a quarter inch? What if it's a step with a, with a rounded edge on it? And so you've got so much variability and unstructured kind of information. How do you communicate this to the world so people can actually book a listing that works for them? And so the beginning with everything, it starts with, 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 with empathy and understanding people. And even though I am a wheelchair user and I've been in like the disability community and have friends with disabilities, it's, it was really important that actually we start from first principles and speak to people. So um, early on, like one of the first things that we did was just making sure that we're regularly doing community research. So when I was living in San Francisco, um, we would regularly reach out to local community groups, disability groups, bring them into the office to share their experiences. Staff could hear those experiences and getting feedback on everything that we were building. Um, so secondly, it can't just be a case of me, um, you know, bringing people into an office in San Francisco. So um, in 2018, did like a bit of a tour around the major cities in the US um, running open houses where we just opened up a, an evening, a talk to anyone who was interested in accessibility and people sort of town hall style, people could ask me and my team questions about what we were doing. And, you know, some people weren't, were a bit frustrated. Some were actually really unhappy that we had neglected accessibility so long, but this was just a great opportunity for me to communicate what exactly I wanted the team to do and actually just get, we get feedback. And I think this is one of the things that people just appreciated the most that we really went out there to, to communicate what we were trying to do, but also manage expectations that this is, that this is a journey. It's going to require a lot of work over time, but to, to, to get with us and, and, join, and join us in this journey. And so what did this actually mean in practice? So um, last year when I was in San Francisco, I led a team of around 25, a mixture of um, data scientists, designers, engineers, product managers, policy experts, 
uh, a real sort of full stack team to sort of build out this new vertical. Um, so the first thing we did, there used to be a box called wheelchair accessible, which has never really meant anything to anyone. We took that out and created all the, the filters, um, some of which we had in a comma ball, some were a little bit more tailored around Airbnb um, and uh, incorporated those in, in, into, the, into, the, into the search platform. Um, secondly, you know, when I was uh, sort of said semi-jokingly earlier about the pictures that having having lots of pictures of lots of toilets, um, in order to make sure data is accurate and we're collecting good information from hosts, um, we made it mandatory where if you want to say you have a particular type of feature um, on your listing, you could only add that feature if you add a photo. Um, an improved merchandising experience. If you go onto the Airbnb app now before anything accessibility related was sort of buried quite deep within the app. Um, and, but now all of that has been elevated to the front of the listing. So it's one of the first things you see when you go onto an Airbnb listing on the site or on the app. Um, if we know that you have searched um, using an accessibility filter and you've made a booking, you'll then get a questionnaire from us afterwards asking uh, you to kind of comment and provide feedback on that information and whether it was accurate or not. Um, and actually, you know, trying to get like a rich data set that we can use in the future to improve search, but also give recommendations to hosts that guests are saying that, you know, a little bit more clarity is needed, um, needed on a listing. And again, talking about photography, it is like really hard to know um, whether a listing has something like the photography is key in a lot of instances. And so we did a pilot project. Unfortunately, it was put on pause um, just before COVID. Hopefully, it's something we can do again. But we, were, um, we, we ran a pilot project towards the end of last year where we were working with disabled people who were unemployed and paying them to actually review photos and review listings and providing feedback to hosts on how they can improve that listing. And again, it's just a photo of somebody in action doing a review for us. Um, and if interested, this is just uh, a quick shot of what the of what the of what the tool looked like. So um, somebody would see the listing, and um, again, it was just some simple questions about whether the information was actually present. And then finally, even though like product is just a part of what we do, um, there is a lot about community engagement. So Airbnb um, is sponsoring. Um, both the Olympics and the Paralympics till 2020, 2028 as a tier one sponsor. Um, so part of the reason I was able to come back to London in January was as part of a rotation to help build out the partnership with the Paralympics. And also we are a signatory to the Valuable 500 where it's an executive level commitment around accessibility and, and disability inclusion. And then um, the final sort of piece of this is around like host education and and educating sort of the wider Airbnb community, no matter how sort of good a product may be on sort of tech and pixels and, um, and, and whether it's like digitally accessible, it's really important, especially in travel, that it's not just about, you know, our, our boxes getting ticked on a product, that we can also make sure that, pe that disabled people are getting just as good a travel experience as anybody else. So um, again, we talked a little bit about photography education. This is just a before and after of, of, of the impact of having a host who went through a little bit of photography training with us. So the photo on the left, you just cannot tell like whether this shower is usable or not. Um, with a bit of training about how to take a good picture, you can see that the shower unit is now incredibly easy to, to see that look, this is something that, that, that is usable. Um, in 2019, um, we brought some of our best performing hosts around the world into a room um, in different, in, so in 25 different cities. And me and colleagues would just run training workshops around inclusivity, um, sensitivity around disability, and just how to create a great experience um, if, if someone does have accessibility needs. And so this was uh, regrettably my travel schedule around 2019. Um, just running these workshops in, in different places. Um, so again, apologies that this was a lot to sort of digest in a, in a relatively short space of time. 
but I just kind of want to share um, a few learnings that accessibility is a journey. Like we still at Airbnb have a lot of things to do. We are, we are still at the beginning. Um, but I feel that one of the most important steps that the company took was making sure that people were accountable for it. And, you know, when I was running the team, it was a key thing for me that anybody who wanted to work in accessibility or within, or within, within our group, it was really important that those individuals were accountable. They had OKRs that were tracked against it. This is what performance reviews would be sort of um, done against. This was no longer sort of a nice to do sort of thing. This would be something that would be professionalized and have people working on it. So I think that accountability piece is, is really important. Um, secondly, and again, I, I feel it is still really sad and surprising to this day, like how, how few companies out there actually engage with disabled people. Um, before I started Accommable, like it was always, you know, again, interesting and like sad, interesting that just how few companies would reach out to disabled people to get their feedback. And it was pretty much like the first thing we did at Accommable, the first thing we did at Airbnb. And actually my old startup, half the team were, were folks with disabilities. So like if there is, again, a really high impact thing that those watching tonight can do, it's just making sure you're working with disabled people, employing them, or even just continuously getting feedback on your product. It's, it's, not a, it's not a hard thing to do. And it's one of those things where it doesn't cost a lot. It just requires intentionality. And if you are getting feedback on your product, as product managers, it is the feedback from focus groups and user testing sessions that often gets you know, prioritized more than other forms of feedback. So just having that feedback in a product development process it's just a very easy but high impact, low cost way of, 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 of making something more accessible. And then finally, um, again, this one's a, it's, it's really important to me that we do see accessibility, ooh, that we do see accessibility as, as an opportunity to create a great experience. So many of the features that you saw that we've launched, like even though we've built them for the purposes of accessibility, we think that they can be used by so many other user segments, whether it be, I don't know, parents with young children or elderly people. There, there's so many other customer segments that will find that information really valuable and useful. And so it's really, I think, really important that we see accessibility as something that is an opportunity and not just something that, that we do because, look, we're scared of people getting angry or lawsuits or, what, or as a compliance item. And I think when it's, when it's framed in the positive, I think it becomes much more institutionalized within the company and just has more impact in, in, in the long term. And so, um, like, thank you very much. Like, um, you know, happy to, to follow up with anyone if they have any questions now or afterwards or, 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 or reach me on LinkedIn or whatever. And yeah, it's something I'm super passionate about and, and love to be able to help in any way I can. Cool. Very very good, very interesting, Srein. And um, I think we share your, your passion about this topic. Um, we have one quick question uh, in the interest of time, because I know you have an hard stop in probably a couple of minutes. So uh, Fraser is saying, what's the main difference between accessibility and inclusion? Is one easier to design for than the other? Um. Yes, and I wouldn't say that the, the, the one's more difficult. I think they are, they are slightly different things. I think sort of the inclusion is probably more of like a mindset and a culture within the organization that people don't see sort of minority groups or actually I don't even think it's a minority group, but they don't see people outside of the core segment as just a bit of an afterthought. I think some of the things around specifically around accessibility can be a little bit more tactical. It is, you know, it is the product built in a certain way? Is it communicating the right information? But I think you can only do accessibility well if there is a culture of inclusion within the organization. Cool, that's a, that's a very good answer, I think. That's great, um, thank you. Um, so we, um, Srin was our last speaker, uh, but we have one more thing to show you, uh, is the Cards for Humanity demo. Um, if you can just give us a minute, we're going to be back uh, with the Cards for Humanity.
Thanks everybody for sticking around. Um, obviously, I know that we are now well, like way over our time, but if anybody does want to stay, um, we would really love to show you Cards for Humanity. So essentially, it's a super simple tool. Um, uh, I'm just going to jump in and show you actually. For it to work, what we need is a problem. So we have a, a fictional problem for a fictional supermarket. But uh, we all know that supermarkets have seen huge changes this year. So what we'd like you to keep in mind for the next five minutes is think about how supermarkets could make their weekly shop more inclusive for their customers. So I'm just going to um, skip over to Cards for Humanity. Um, hopefully you should be able to see that by now. And I'm just going to deal some cards. So. Um, it's thinking. Okay. So the way Cards for Humanity works is it pairs a person and a trait of some kind. And there's loads in here, although actually our next step is to is to build it out even more so that there's even more variety, more breadth, all of those things. But in this example, and I'll deal a new pair for, for when we're actually doing the demo, but in this example, Catherine is 65, is easily distracted and has arthritis. So in the tool, you then just flip the cards to see that person's needs. So um, I've already forgotten what Catherine said. Catherine is easily distracted. So it can be difficult to hold some people's attention. It can be challenging for people to remember key information. Some people need more orientation in a process so they know what step they're on. Um, and this, this, this is a this is a massive spectrum. So some people, everybody actually in today's society suffers from continual partial attention deficit because we're so used to skipping between things. But for some people, it's a much more extreme issue. And then on the other side, having arthritis can make physical movement painful and difficult. Complex or cramped digital user interfaces can be hard for people to use. And arthritis isn't just a problem for older people. It can affect young people as well. So I'm going to deal a new pair. And what we'd love you to do is in the chat, um, think about how for this person, so Mike is very independent and is deaf. Um, think about how for this person, supermarkets could improve their experiences to make them more inclusive for Mike. So I think one thing to... Um, to think about as you're going through this is remember to think about Mike. There's loads of things that we all want to change about supermarkets. Um, but for this for this exercise, just think for a few minutes and share your thoughts on in the chat about how might we improve the supermarket experience for Mike. Um, Enrico, have I forgotten anything? Oh, absolutely. I think that, yeah, yeah. 
our audience, if they can share their thoughts in the format of how might we, that would be great. And they yep. can do it in YouTube or Menti. I'm just going to turn the cards over so you can see some of the things that you might want to consider. But uh, yeah, just start sharing your ideas and we'll read out um, some of them as we go through. I will just make sure that the Menti thing is still working. So I've seen that uh, we've got a suggestion for visual announcements instead of the audio ones. That also has just um, reminded me to say this can be on or offline supermarket. It doesn't need to be um, just in person. Um, obviously, there are different, um, there is online and offline have different affordances for people, but also different issues come up in those experiences. Uh, so I've seen um, visual wayfinding, a new tell opening up should have a green flashing light along with verbal announcements, which would stop the uh, um, daily, I think, fight to get to the front of the new TV when the checkout opens. Um, more signposting, including BSL in the videos. Um, these are great suggestions. Um, so I guess as well as thinking about things for um, Mike's deafness, also thinking about his independence. So how might how might that impact the way that he experiences the supermarket? Again, whether that's on or offline. And also think about the whole end-to-end -end experience, so finding the things you want, uh, checking out, paying for them, getting the food home. So if you're in store, um, is there anything that we could do around the um, packaging up, bags, all of that kind of thing? But um, if it's online, then thinking about deliveries. Um, yeah, Simon, that's a great suggestion. Sign language training for store personnel. Um, FAQ, so you don't have to ask someone. Uh, so there's some really cool things there. I think um, for those of you who are still with us, so and I thank you very much for staying, I'm going to deal a new pair just because one of the things about Cards for Humanity is that it works best when you, um, you kind of layer up things. So you would spend some time, probably slightly longer than we have, thinking about Mike, and then you deal again. So now we've got Verla... McPeters, who is 95 and is disorganized and has received bad news about a loved one. So you might think that those things don't really have anything to do with your shopping. Uh, but thinking about the supermarket experience, again, on or offline, how might you change things for Verla to improve the experience? So just to uh, highlight the, her needs. So some people forget key information and can get easily confused. They might not necessarily have the right information to hand. How would that impact you in a supermarket, online or offline? And having received news about uh, bad news about a loved one, uh, it can be hard to concentrate when you just heard bad news. It can cause people to react angrily or irrationally. And also communications could hurt, could cause hurt or offence if received at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. So Harry, absolutely don't send email re reminders about Valentine's Day. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's all kinds of crazy messaging that um, goes yeah. out with good intentions that can be quite painful. Genau. Super, alles klar. Um, any more suggestions for Verla? How do you remind them about expiry dates of products when they... Um, simplify messages, yeah, they're all really great suggestions. So shall I do it again? Um, just for, I'm going to do one more. And then I'll tell you about the competition and we'll say goodbye and thank you so much for coming. And it's been amazing to have you here. So Kristen Lippum, 
uh, likes to plan everything in advance and is blind. So uh, as a as an extreme contrast to Vola, we've got somebody who's who's a planner. That Kristen really likes to uh, he needs to feel or he or she needs to feel prepared. If you make changes to products or services without consulting them, you're likely to lose their trust. Um, people who are blind are probably use an accessibility aid like a screen reader or have somebody helping them. Visual content needs to be described in text. So yeah, thoughts about Kristen. Oh, sorry. Oh no, I've ruined it all. Um, that's probably a good time for us to um, wrap up. I'm, I hope that that gave you enough of a chance to um, see the tool in action and, and get a bit of a flavor for it. We've been using it quite a lot in workshops. It's been super interesting. We've um, tried it with a bunch of different companies. Um, and we're still kind of, we're still learning as we're doing it, how to get the, the best out of it. So far we've used it for idea generation, for um, thinking about, how to improve existing products and services. It's kind of, it, it, it runs through the whole product life cycle. So do give it a try. Um, it is free and out there in the real world. Um, so we mentioned at the beginning that we had a competition. What we'd really like is for people to use Cards for Humanity. And I've just realized that I don't have a link to it on here. I'm assuming everybody in the universe knows where to find Cards for Humanity. Um, but it's cardsforhumanity.idean.com. Um, we'd really like you to use it. Um, and so to sort of nudge people into using it, if you can use Cards for Humanity and then post something on Twitter or on LinkedIn using our um, at IDN UK or hashtag by people or both preferably, tell us what you're using it to do. Um, we just really want to hear about it, basically, and to and to get people using it, embedding it in their their day to day work. So um, the prize is we've got five physical packs of cards for humanity, which we uh, printed pre pandemic, and they're really beautiful. And actually, one day we hope that we will be able to um, have physical workshops again. Um, but we're going to pick the winners at random, um, and. We will, so we're gonna send a follow-up email about this event anyway, so you'll get more details on this. But it will be great if you can um, get posting, get sharing, you might get to win some cards. Uh, and I think that's it. So I think then the only other thing really to say is um, thank you so much for coming and for staying all the way to the end. And um, we'll see you at the next one. And uh, yeah, it's been great, thanks so much. Thank you.